Well, good morning to everyone on this beautiful Lord's Day, right? So we gather as God's people, and we never, ever want to take that for granted, do we? Right? Nothing more important than meeting as the people of God. Right? Uh, it's been enjoyable again to be uh, here at the church and in Denton, Texas. It's been great to get to know over these last a year ago and, and now this year, uh, Trey and the elders and the team, and um, it's always encouraging to see uh, faithful local churches, right? Uh, sometimes we worry about everything around us, but it all starts locally. <laughs> starts with your family, starts with your church, your local church, right? And uh, then seeking to influence and take the gospel to the surrounding city, state, the nation, the world. Right? So, always encouraged, and it's great to see uh, the work of the Lord here uh, at the church. Now, I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Isaiah 40, a familiar portion. We'll be looking at this uh, chapter um, and looking at, really, the greatness of our God. The title I've given to the message, and we'll bring this out as we work through it, is renewing our confidence. Renewing our confidence in our God who makes and keeps his promises. Right? So renewing our confidence in our God who makes and keeps his promises. And of course, making and keeping promises is tied to his covenant, right? So he is the God who is the creator and covenant Lord. And that's who we're renewing our confidence in, the triune God that we worship and adore. Now, I won't read the entire chapter at this point, but we'll look at the first eight verses and then we will work through it as we look at the entire chapter. But at this point, let us read verses one through eight and hear uh, the word of the Lord. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all mankind together will see it. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All men are like grass. Their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, the flowers fall, because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. Well, let's pray and ask the Lord to make this chapter uh, that gives us the glory of God real to us and truly that it will this day and this week renew our confidence in him. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you have not left us in the dark. Yes, the glory of creation testifies the heavens and the earth to your glory, yet apart from your special revelation, apart from your word revelation, your promises, your actions in history, your actions to save and to judge and to redeem, to enter into relationship with us in terms of covenants, we would not have your promises. We would not know of you in the way that 
Just looking at creation would give us a knowledge of you. We would not know something of your heart and something of your grace and something of what you have promised and done and brought about and supremely brought about in the Lord Jesus. We pray that as we gather this morning and as we look at this familiar but glorious section of Scripture, that you truly will renew our confidence in you. We live in challenging days. We live in days that make us often depressed. And so we pray that we would lift our eyes to you, that we would behold our God, that we would see that this portion of Scripture that was written many, many, many years ago testifies to us today of your glory and testifies of the Lord Jesus. And help us to, in this time together, give you glory, renew our trust, leave here this week desirous to know you more, to love you, to obey you, to serve you, to make you known. We commit our time to you. Help us to this end, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Renewing our confidence. Why do we need to renew our confidence? Well, I don't think I have to tell you. Uh, we are in a mess. Our world's in a mess. <laughs> it's always been that way, but it seems to be even more in a mess. Our nation's in a mess, right? So even now, Afghanistan's been in the news, right? Even now, drones are hitting uh, at Kabul airport, and, but all of it's a mess, right? All of it in terms of our government leadership has failed. Uh, you could go back to the Old Testament and look at leaders. We'll even see Hezekiah just briefly. As we look at Isaiah 40, witless, <laughs> feckless, useless leaders, right? And they just now bring tyranny upon tyranny. I mean, this is the kind of world we live in, right? Until the end of the age, until Jesus comes, right? We will face increasingly challenging days. The gospel will go forth, but the world that we live in is tumultuous, right? We see it just almost in our country where internally it's self-destructing, right? And this is what's happened in civilizations over the years, right? Augustine, as he lived end of the 300s, early mid-400s, as the western portion of the Roman Empire collapsing, it was collapsing right before his very eyes, he had to remind the church, right, that there is two cities, there's two kingdoms, there's the city of God that lasts forever, that's what we are a part of, the church, the kingdom of God, and there's the city of man that will come to destruction. And that is all nations, all governments will come ultimately or the city of man. Right? We have to keep that in mind, and we need to live our lives with that reality before us. Right? In the church, we are in a mess. Right? Now, we'll speak particularly of just North America, the Western world, and so on. I don't know if you uh, follow the the poll that comes out every two years. So far, it's come out every two years since 2014. It's called the State of Theology Poll. It's, it's uh, done by, you had Steve Nichols here, so maybe he told you about it. Uh, it's done by Ligonier, his, what he's part of, and uh, Lifeway, two interesting partners. <laughs> so Ligonier and Lifeway together, right? The State of Theology Poll since 2014, every other year. So last year, they took their 2020, uh, before COVID hit, right? So they, and then I'm assuming next year, 2022, they will do it again. It's really helpful just to see what American society thinks, because it's about 3,000 people. But you can, you can go in and you can click <laughs> certain portions where you, it breaks it down into male, female, and age, and belief system, church affiliation, right? So you can click in there, evangelicals, belief, and then you can click evangelical affiliation. So you put both of those on, that's about as strong as you can get that's going to reflect the church, right? So people who say not only I believe the Bible and I believe in the gospel and I believe in evangelical faith and so on, and they actually attend an evangelical church, right? So you've got as about as strong as you can get. But when you look at the questions that are asked, you say, oh my goodness, we're in trouble. So they get the doctrine of the Trinity right, except 1%. So 99% say we believe in the Trinity. I don't know what happened to the other 1%. So that's not Christian belief. But then you deep, you know, a bit deeper, right? So the statement that says God accepts the worship of 
all religions. And then it lists three of them. But it's at all. Uh, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, but it's at all, right? 25%. Yep, God accepts the, re the worship of all religions, right? That's, that's evangelical affiliation and belief. Right? That's not the general population, right? Or when you delve into the person of Christ. So 99% say they believe in God the Son. So that would be the deity of Christ, wouldn't it? But then when asked, or this given a statement, Jesus is a great teacher, but not God. Now, if it was consistent, you would say, you know, only 1% would agree with that, right? If 99% are holding the Trinity. But what you have is 14% are basically denying the deity of Christ. Of course, that, then, they, then, of course, that shows you they don't believe properly in the Trinity. Or when you come to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is a force. They've been watching too much of George Lucas and Star Wars at this point, right? Uh, the Holy Spirit's a force, not a person. 36% of evangelicals, right, say, yes, that's, he's a force. Right? So obviously you've got, I mean, just massive problems. And then when you talk about sin, because all these things are related. Right? If you think that God accepts the worship of all religions, you don't know who he is and you don't know your sin. Right? That's, so when they say, humans sin a little, but they're basically good by nature. So basically come into the world good, right? Well, 32% of evangelicals say yes to that. Now, what's this mean? We can bang away at this and bash the church. Right? It just simply means we're in trouble. Right? It means there needs to be faithful local churches, faithful exposition, faithful teaching of the Bible and theology, countering the views of the day, not privatizing your faith. And when you go out into the world, it has no public relevance. I mean, none of that has to, we have to get back to basics 101, right? Now, that's just sort of this challenge we live in, right? I get depressed by those things. <laughs> and I constantly need to say, I've got to come back to first principles. Right? I've got to come back to first ground, right? I have to renew my confidence, not in people, right? Not in a government, not in a nation. There's no hope there. Not in even, you know, family members and so on. I've got to renew my confidence in God, right? And that's constant message throughout all of scripture. Where do we turn? We turn to the God of the universe, right? The creator, the Lord, the covenant God, the triune God, who makes promises, who keeps promises, who is totally trustworthy, who is working out his purposes in history, and I can trust him wholly and fully, right? Now, where do we turn to renew our confidence of him? Well, obviously, we're going to go to Isaiah 40, right? But there's a lot of portions in Scripture, right? So you've been studying the book of Hebrews. There's, there's in the New Testament, you couldn't have a better example of renewal of confidence in the God who makes and keeps his promises in Christ Jesus, right? That just puts your whole Bible together. It reminds you of all of God's plan. But, you know, Isaiah in the Old Testament is a counterpoint to that, right? Isaiah has been known as the fifth gospel. And you say, I thought there were only four gospels, right? But it's the fifth gospel in the sense that, right, in prophetic revelation, it anticipates not only God in all of his glory and greatness, but the God who has made promises, and he's now keeping those promises, and has kept now, in hindsight, we know this, he's kept his promises in Christ Jesus. Now, Isaiah 40 is just one chapter in Isaiah that 40 through 48, and other sections, chapter 6, and so on, the whole book of Isaiah, if you want to say, how do you teach the sovereignty of God and the power of God and the glory of God? Well, you just go to Isaiah. I mean, and how much the New Testament quotes Isaiah. Now, Isaiah 40 is one of those chapters, but it's not the only one. It's just part of a section. And Isaiah 40 has been made famous, right? So at Christmas time, if you enjoy Handel's Messiah, right? Comfort, comfort, what we just read is the pastoral scene that comes in Handel's Messiah that opens up the anticipation of the coming of Christ, right? And we know of that. Or if you remember, now this will date me, and some people may have never seen this movie before. And if you haven't, you should, right? It's Chariots of Fire. How many have seen Chariots of Fire, right? Yeah. 
Chariots of Fire, Eric Liddell, famous missionary to China in the 1920s, right? And he was a Sabbatarian, and he wouldn't run on Sunday, and one of his races was put on Sunday. And they switched him to, from the 100 meters to the 400 meters in the Paris Olympics. But they have him on Sunday in the Presbyterian Church. He was Presbyterian, he was Scottish. And he's in the Presbyterian Church, and the movie makers, right? It's interesting, the movie makers of Chariots of Fire, one of them was Princess Diana's boyfriend that they were killed in the car accident, Dodi Fayed, interesting enough, the Muslim. And they presented the Christian, though, in the most positive of terms, right? And they presented Eric Liddell standing up in the pulpit, reading from Isaiah 40. <laughs> and as he was speaking about men like grass, and the nations are a drop in the bucket, it then would go over to the Olympics and seeing people fall and fail and doing steeplechase and falling in the water and so on. It was just a beautiful contrast. He's standing up proclaiming God that he is now obeying and so on. So I mean, uh, Chariots of Fire is just a wonderful, wonderful uh, movie, and especially if you are a runner, right, you, you, you would appreciate uh, that. And of course, he was a very well-known missionary and a very faithful man and died ultimately in, um, in a concentration camp in, uh, in China. Right? Now, Isaiah 40, wonderful portion. How are we going to break it down today? Well, we'll look at the chapter, but before, we're going to look at it in three steps. Primarily, the second step is where most of our time is going to be spent. But, you know, as you approach anything in Scripture, you, we all know you set context, right? Isaiah 40 is embedded in the book of Isaiah. But it's not just embedded in the book of Isaiah, it's embedded in the Old Testament. It's crucial to understand. We won't fully understand all that's going on here unless we first, right, set the context of the chapter in the book, in some sense, the Old Testament. So that's the first thing we're going to do. Secondly, then, just look at the chapter itself. After setting the context, then see how it just simply unfolds, right? And even then, it's really part of a whole section, right? But we'll just look at it in terms of chapter 40 and then draw briefly, right, how this is now fulfilled in Christ, right? How we now look in hindsight, right? We look at these presentation and we look even at the promises. And, of course, this is where in Scripture we will now, as Christians, have greater confidence, right? greater trust, greater hope, because what God has said in the past and actually now done, right? The nation of Israel has this looking forward. We now have it looking backward. So we're going to set the context, look at the chapter itself to see how it's broken down, giving us the majestic presentation of God who is creator and covenant God who keeps promises and then draw its application to Christ. Now, let's first set the context. Isaiah 40, right? Most of you know, I'm sure, right? Isaiah, right, is one of the major prophets, major minor prophets in terms of their size, not in terms of their importance, right? Isaiah, as a major prophet, all of the prophets, it's very important to see this, all the prophets write after the Davidic covenant, right? Now, some of them write at the time of the collapse, which is Isaiah, of the northern tribes, and some right before the southern tribes get taken to exile, and in the exile, and after exile. But all of them write in terms of the covenants, the promises of God. They all write after David. They're all post-Davidic. Isaiah is about 700 years before the coming of Christ. Right? Liberal scholars have loved to hack this book up. It shouldn't be hacked up. It's one book. It's Isaiah, living 700 years before Christ, giving his prophecy, uh, warning the nation of Israel, and then looking forward to ultimately the coming of Christ. At this time, as you know, right, Israel is, as a nation, is divided. Ten northern tribes, two southern tribes, Isaiah is from the south. Right? He's from Judah. And he ministers at a time where the superpower of the day <laughs> is Iraq, in some sense, but it's Assyria. Right? So Assyria is northern Iraq, up into southeast Turkey in our maps today, but it's Assyria as the superpower. And during Isaiah's lifetime, the ten northern tribes, what we now call Israel, at that time, Israel versus Judah, those ten northern tribes are forever destroyed. Right? 722 BC is when right, Assyria comes in, wipes out the northern tribes, and all you have left is Judah, which then is where the Davidic king is. And eventually, Judah gets taken off 
to exile with Babylon. And that happens 130 some years later. Right? So here's the time period Isaiah is ministering in. So he's going to witness the fall of the north. He is speaking at the time where Babylon is on the rise. But they're not on the rise for another 100 years. That's a long time. He speaks to a number of kings. So we come in Isaiah 6 to Uzziah, right? It's the year Uzziah died, he sees the Lord, right? So Uzziah was there, but then he dies. And then he speaks with other kings, Jotham, Ahaz. You see him in Isaiah 7, a witless Davidic king who won't believe God. And God has to say, I'll give you a sign. <laughs> believe me. And he says, oh, no, no, I, I, I don't want to tempt you, Lord. And just all of these kings are disasters. And Hezekiah is the main one that sets the context to Isaiah 40. So he speaks during this time. There's other prophets that are also ministering, Micah, Amos, Hosea, and so on, right? In Isaiah's lifetime, there's two major crises, right? The fall of the north and Ahaz. So in Isaiah 7, he speaks to King Ahaz, who's in the south, because Ahaz is not trusting the Lord. He's trying to make alliances with foreign nations. Disastrous. Now, Isaiah says, don't do it, but he does it anyway. And then, of course, the crisis with Hezekiah, the same problem with Hezekiah. Now, Hezekiah was a little bit better. Eventually, Hezekiah trusted the Lord, and in Isaiah 36 and 37, you remember the angel of the Lord comes through the camp, and Sennacherib is, is, and his, his army is, many of his army are killed, and, and Assyria pulls back from the south, right, temporarily, right? So Isaiah is ministering. He's speaking to these kings, particularly the Davidic kings, and saying, trust the Lord. Right? In chapters 1 through 5 of Isaiah, right, you have just a disastrous presentation of both the north and the south. And the disaster is, is that this nation has turned against the covenant. They've rebelled against God. You read those chapters, right? They have little children ruling them. There's nothing wrong with children, but they're not wise, right? Sounds familiar, right? Unwise people making decisions that are disastrous. The religious leaders have failed. All of the shepherds of Israel, prophets, priests, and kings have failed. And that's why in Isaiah 6, right? I don't know if you ask yourself, why is it that Isaiah 6 starts in Isaiah 6? <laughs> I mean, it's Isaiah's call to ministry. Why not chapter 1? Wouldn't you think that the call to ministry would be in chapter 1? Well, it's not because Isaiah 1 through 5 is, in some sense, introduction. It's setting you up for chapter 6, isn't it? What do you see in Isaiah 6? In light of the disaster of the nation, all the leaders have failed. What? And then I, Uzziah dies, right? So what happens when now the head of the nation dies? Everything is in disarray. What does Isaiah have to, who does he have to renew his confidence in? The Lord, right? So he goes into the temple. Everything's in shambles, and he sees the Lord high and lifted up, right? Remember Isaiah 63, he's the Holy One, right? And then he gets his commission and, and so on, right? All of that's telling you, right, the hope for the nation is found in the Lord, right? Now, in addition to that, and this becomes important as we move to Isaiah 40, as you look at the prophets, and this is where you have to sort of set... Isaiah in terms of the Old Testament, and particularly what I already sort of alluded to, all of the prophets write after David, after the Davidic covenant, right? The prophetic message says this. So there's two points of the prophetic message. One is, you as the nation have violated the covenant, you're cursed. Right? That's, that's the negative point portion. The positive message is, the Lord... You're to look to him, the Holy One, and he will keep his promises, but the promises are always centered in the king. And why is that? Because of the promises that go all the way back to Genesis 3.15. Right? From the fall of Adam, right? God has, by grace, chosen to save us, restore this world, save a people for himself, and what does God say in Genesis 3.15? I will save you. I will put enmity. Right? He's going to take the initiative. And he says, I will do so by the provision of a seed of the woman. Now that just starts running through the entire Bible, doesn't it? A 
Eventually, as you work through the covenants, we know who the seed of the woman is. It's the king. And not just any king, it's the Davidic king. Right? David becomes an entire pattern of the Messiah to come. Right? He is going to be the one who's a forerunner of the seed of the woman. Right? And then you can look at other passages where the king will be a priest and the king will rule. The king will bring God's rule. So always in the prophets, there's two ideas that come together. For God to save us, God must act. God will keep his promises, but keeping his promises means he will do so through the provision of a king. Now, it's that you have to understand to understand Isaiah 40. Because in Isaiah 40, now delving down into here, there's a further context of Isaiah 40, which is chapter 38 and 39, right? So when you read a book, you've got to figure out how it's put together, the author is putting it together in terms of its literary, right? We have chapters and verses. That was never there in the original, right? It's all one book, but it's broken into sections. And you, in a good Bible reader, right, a good reader, uh, you're to be able to figure out those sections. Well, 38 and 39 front loads chapter 40. Now, why is that? Because if you read Isaiah, right, this is all about Hezekiah the king. And Hezekiah, verses 36 and 37, is, an, is a story about Hezekiah. That's where God protects Hezekiah, the southern tribes, and removes Sennacherib. And then in 38 and 39, it's another story where Hezekiah gets sick unto death. And he prays to God, and God says, I will spare your life and give you 15 more years. Now, 38 through 39 recounts that but it recounts it in the book after 36 and 37, obviously. But in Hezekiah's life, they were inverted. The case of his health situation was prior in history to the defeat of Sennacherib. Sennacherib came after his health crisis, but Isaiah in the book puts them opposite. Now, why is that? Well, he's signaling to you, you must read Hezekiah 30, or Isaiah 38 and 39 with 40 in what follows. And what follows is all the way through chapter 55. Right? Now, why would that be important? Well, when we open up in chapter 40, verse 1, comfort, comfort, you have to ask yourself, why do they need comfort? <laughs> what is the comfort about? Right? Now, you could say, well, it's because of the disaster of the nation. That's true, but it's more specific than that. Right? So in chapter 39, if you just flip over there, chapter 38 has described Hezekiah and his health issues. He's sickness unto death. God spares his life, gives him 15 more years, and he thanks Hezekiah, thanks him. But then in chapter 39, as he's recovering, right? We read in verse 1, at that time, Merodach Baladin, son of Baladin, king of Babylon, sent Hezekiah letters and a gift because he had heard of his illness and his recovery, right? So now you have envoys from Babylon. Babylon is not the superpower. It's on the rise. It has Assyria in its sights and says, we've got to get rid of Assyria. Right? So they send envoys to Hezekiah. And what's going on here is they're trying to make alliances with him, right? They're trying to get a party together. And in fact, Egypt and Babylon are trying to plot together, join. At this time, the northern tribes are destroyed. So they're trying to get now Judah on, on board with them. And what Hezekiah does is he, in verse 2, he receives the envoys gladly, shows them all of his storehouses and so on. And, and he just opens up his kingdom to him. But this isn't just sort of show and tell type of thing. He is now, you do this to make a treaty with them to say, let's plot together to go against Assyria. Now, the problem with this is, is he's not trusting the Lord. He's not giving himself to God. You do not make foreign alliances. So that's why in verse 3, Isaiah comes in and says to him, what did those men say? Where did they come from? Of course, he knows exactly what's going on, but he's probing Hezekiah to pull it out of him. What are you doing? Well, they came from a distant land. They came from Babylon. The prophet said, what did they see in your palace? They saw everything in my palace. There's nothing among the treasures that I did not show them. And then Isaiah says to him, from the Lord, 
Hear the word of the Lord Almighty. The time will surely come when everything in your palace, your fathers have stored up until this day, will be carried off to Babylon. So this is still 120, 30 years in the, in the future. But he's saying, because you did this, you are going into exile. Right? And that eventually anticipates the Babylonian exile. He says, you'll be taken away. You will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. And of course, that's exactly, you read Old Testament history, that's exactly what happens. Now, Hezekiah, <laughs> leaders have not changed one bit. Listen to his response, right? The word of the Lord you have spoken is good, Hezekiah replied. For he thought, and this is typical, well, it's 130 years down the road. He doesn't know exactly 130 years. It's down the road. It's not going to happen to me, so who cares? <laughs> we'll just pass it on to the kids. Right? And that's what he's basically doing. He thought there will be peace and security in my lifetime. I call this the Hezekiah syndrome. I have a son who works in the Senate in Washington, D.C., and I said, don't follow the Hezekiah syndrome in Washington, D.C., but they do it all the time. Right? Pass it off to the kids. We don't care. And Hezekiah is just simply faithless. Right? Now, why is this such an important point that sets us up for chapter 40, verse 1? Because the comfort is set in the context of, I am destroying what? The Davidic house. But if we know in the context of Scripture that the promise ultimately of the reversal of Adam's sin, the bringing of salvation and judgment and hope is all tied to the Davidic house. <laughs> if the Davidic house is destroyed... God's promises are almost gone. Right? It's almost as if, right, you, you have the same kind of episode with Abraham. Abraham knows that the hope of the world is found in Isaac, and then God says, sacrifice him. And you've got to think, how can he be the hope of the world if he's dead? Something similar is going on here, right? If the Davidic house no longer exists, and in Isaiah the Davidic house is presented as a big tree that is just cut off, if that happens, then has God failed? It, maybe it's because human sin, think of the flood, right? It looks like things are really desperate in the flood. Sin is so bad that God has to wipe away everybody. It's almost like there's no hope, but uh, there's a glimmer because he saves one family. <laughs> and it's almost like here, if he wipes away the Davidic house, where's the hope? You made promises that you would bring salvation to this world how do we trust you? How? Now you need comfort. And it's in that context then that when you read in verse 6, nothing will be left. The whole Davidic house is going to be cut off. In some sense you say the hope of the world is gone. Then God says, even though I'm cutting off the Davidic house, you've got to trust me. And that's where he then says, comfort, comfort my people. And of course, now what this is doing is, of course, he's, in, he's, he's preparing them, right? When the nation of Israel goes through all of this down 100 years or so, and they're 70 years in Babylon, they're going to begin to wonder, what happened? <laughs> but God ahead of time is saying, I'm in charge. I will keep my promises. You guys are witless, but I will be faithful. I will bring forth the king. And that's the context of what is going on here. And that's why already in the book, he's already mentioned the king over and over again. But in Isaiah, all the way through 55, eventually this is the section that you have the servant of the Lord, isn't it? The servant of the Lord who will be given. The servant of the Lord who will bring salvation. The servant, I mean, all of this is setting us up for the coming of Christ. Now that's 40, right? And you have to read 38. Isaiah intends for you to read 38 and 39 with 40 through 55. It's all one section. And if you, that's why I say uh, this isn't just about God and all of his creation and so on. This is about a God who makes promises. This is about a God who keeps promises. That's going to be the emphasis. And they can have assurance that he keeps his promises because he's God. Right? He is the creator. He is the Lord. He is sovereign. Now, you turn to Isaiah 40. As this now comfort comes to them, and you set it in that context, right? 
the chapter is basically broken up into sort of four sections. Verses one and two is, is an unnamed voice. <laughs> That is, 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 is the, 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 these are comfort, comfort are imperatives, right? And they're put in the plural. This is voice says, someone rise up and give comfort. Someone announce to the nation of Israel a word. And of course, from that, in verses 3 through 11, we have three voices that arise. So the command is to comfort the people. And the first voice now begins to give comfort. The second voice follows on the first and gives further comfort. The third voice brings more comfort. Right? In all of these areas, you have different aspects of God emphasized. And then you have, in verses 12, really to the end of the chapter, what grounds the comfort is the glory of the Creator, the Lord, the sovereign Lord of the universe, the one who is incomparably different than anything created. He is the God who is independent, self-sufficient, sovereign Lord. I mean, all of that now grounds the reason why you can trust him. The reason why his word will not fail. And then, of course, 41 will then continue in the same emphasis. So, verses 1 and 2, let's first look at this this call to comfort. Uh, The verbs, as I said, are imperatives. Comfort, comfort, a command. Commanding an unnamed number, right? And that becomes the voices to ultimately call to the people, to give comfort to my people. And even that is a glorious phrase. Israel is a disaster, but he's still (laughs) true to the covenant, calls them his people. And he says to them, speak tenderly to them. That tenderly is is almost a wooing language. You you go after someone and you care for them. A young man with a woman woos the woman and so on, right? I mean, that's the idea here. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. God is coming and he says that, I'm going to bring judgment, but I'm bringing uh, a word to you to give comfort to you tenderly uh, and, and to proclaim to you. He says that your hard service has been completed. Your sin has been paid for. You've received from my hand. Right? So it's, it's God's initiative. You receive from my hand double for all your sins. Here is really, right, if you said it in the context of Isaiah and the prophets, this is the promise of the new covenant. The heart of the new covenant, what is it, right? The heart of the new covenant, Jeremiah makes this very clear. All the prophets make this clear. That God is going to do something in the future. He's going to do something in the future by bringing a new covenant. At the heart of that uh, that covenant is the forgiveness of sin. He will not just send them off into exile. He'll bring them back, but he'll do more than that. He will provide, and eventually Isaiah lays this out for you. He'll provide a servant. He'll provide a servant that will deal with the problem of sin. If we had time to look at this whole section through 55, the problem of sin arises all throughout. Israel goes into exile because of her hard-heartedness. And even when she comes out of exile, she's still hard-hearted. <laughs> God must now bring a new covenant, the servant of the Lord who will circumcise hearts. I mean, all of that's part of this context, right? The prophets all look forward to a new covenant. And so this voice then says, speak to Jerusalem. I will keep my promises. I will bring full payment for your sin, right? You've received from the Lord's hand double for our sins. There is a payment that is there. Now, it doesn't say how it's going to happen, but later on in the book, we see that it comes to the servant, right? Now, as this imperatives come, give comfort. Tell them that I'm going to do this. Then you have these voices arise in this kind of, sort of second stage of the chapter, verses 3 through 11. Three voices then come that pick up the command. Give comfort. All right, now the first voice gives comfort. And it follows with the second and the third. So what's the first voice say? And all of them pick up different aspects of God's promises and who he is and so on. Well, the first one says, here's the comfort. A voice is calling. In the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. Now, of course, we now in the New Testament know that as picked up in John the Baptist, isn't it? You fast forward eventually, this John announces the Lord is coming, right? It's still previous to them, but here you have this voice saying, in the desert, prepare a way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Now, many people see this as sort of Exodus imagery. And it 
And there's a lot of Exodus imagery. It could be that, or it could simply, simply be the idea that makes straight the wilderness for our God. Every valley will be raised up. Every mountain will be made low. The rough shall be made level. A rugged place is plain. It just simply means God is now in the future. The voice is saying, God will come and save. God will come and make a highway. In the desert often, often in the Old Testament, the wilderness is the place of where God has to come to his people and he has to comfort them and he has to bring them into the land and so on. And so here you have this anticipation that in the future, right, the Lord will keep his word. He will come and as he comes, you have then in verse 5, his glory will then be revealed so that all mankind will see it. There's coming in the future, the coming of the Lord, who will display his glory and God will bring his promises to pass. And of course, the promises then are picked up by the second voice, right? So God is coming. <laughs> God will save, and then he will keep his word. So in verse 6 through 8, a voice says, cry out, what shall I cry? Well, here's the contrast with humans, Israel, and eventually nations. All men are like grass. Their glory Right? Their glory, right? Glory in Scripture, right? The glory of God often is compared to the chaff and the glory of men. Right? God's glory, even the notion of glory, is this notion of God is of substance and weight. Right? And human glory is fickle and weightless. Right? So you have here, all men are like grass. Grass that just comes and goes and blows in the wind. Their glory is like the flowers of the field. The glass withers, the grass withers, the flowers fall, but the breath blows. I mean, their glory just, just blows over. They're like chaff. But the grass withers, the flowers fall, but notice the word of God stands forever. Right? So the voice, second voice, picking up from the first one. God will come and redeem his people. He will make a highway. He will not forget his promises, even though the Davidic house is destroyed. And he will keep his word. And that just runs through this, and that would be giving the nation of Israel comfort, especially down the road. When they're in the midst of Babylon, they'd say, is God going to keep his word? He told us he would. <laughs> he told us he would. And then verse 9 through 11 is similar, but it's another voice that's picking up a different aspect. You who bring good tidings to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. So here's the third voice. Lift it up and do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, Hear, behold, your God. Right? See, the sovereign Lord comes with power. So the first voice has already said that, hasn't it? God is going to make a highway. God is going to come. He is going to now rescue his people. So the sovereign Lord comes with power. His arm rules for him. His reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. He, he will reward his people. He will bring double for their sins. He will bring ultimately the new covenant in this context. And notice what he says here. And this picks up a lot of Old Testament teaching. He will be the shepherd. <laughs> right, this imagery of God as the shepherd. Israel's leaders are shepherds, but they've all failed. But he will tend his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms. He carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those who have young. So this isn't just a presentation of the creator God who just sort of is removed from the world that doesn't care for his people. No, he's not only made promises that he's going to keep, but he is going to come and care for them. He is going to come and take his flock, right? And he will rule over them, and he will do what the shepherds of Israel didn't ever do. Now, of course, this alludes to a number of places, Psalm 23, right? The Lord is my shepherd. But in the prophets, you can't help think of this in conjunction or connection with Ezekiel 34. Ezekiel 34 is just a glorious chapter of the shepherd, which is really the backdrop to Jesus' statement in John 10, I am the good shepherd. In Ezekiel 34, you can go back and look at it this afternoon, right? God indicts all the leaders of Israel, just like Isaiah does. And then what does God say in Ezekiel 34? He says, I'm going to come and save you. My sheep are scattered all over the mountainside, and I'm going to come and rescue them. That's what Jesus sees in the Gospels, right? And then in Ezekiel 34, God will be the shepherd through the king. 
who brings a new covenant. It's all the same themes, and that's what's being emphasized here. The promises of God, the covenant promises of God, God saving the message of the prophets, God will save through the king. God will provide a better David. And that is what ultimately is giving them hope. Now, in verses 12, as we move from the voices, right? the voices are saying, God is coming, his word is true, he will shepherd his people, you can trust him, only him. Right? Then, of course, all of this is grounded in now reminding them of God. Reminding them that he is the creator, that he is the providential Lord, that he is in a category all by himself, that he is not like the idols of the world, and so on. So here's you have the chapter against idolatry and against making God in your image, and so on. So there's where we have these glorious section here. So I've called this here in verses 12 through 26, Behold your God. Right? Uh, just reminder that God is the one who only can keep his promises, and he will do that. So he's unpacking all of this in the first area, verses 12 through 14, I think, is a section where you have emphasis on creation, but particularly God's knowledge and wisdom. God can be trusted. He knows what he's doing. And in this section here, as we read in verses 12 through 14, it sounds just like Job, right? When you read Job 38, right, what does God do? And Job needs a reminder that, yeah, Job can't figure out how everything is going on. He's in rough straits but God says I will take care of you you got to trust me right? and he presents himself in this same kind of way right all all the time in the Old Testament but here you have in verse 12 who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand or with the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens the marked off language here is it sort of fine-tuned the heavens right speaks of the intricacy of design and his order who has held the dust of the earth so he's measured the waters. He's measured who's the held the dust of the earth in a basket. Who's weighed the mountains in a scales, right? So he's moving, in some sense, the totality of creation. Who's done this? And then he moves to wisdom. Who has understood the mind of the Lord? And that word there, understood, is the same word for marked off. In verse 12 is another way of saying who's fine-tuned the mind of God, right? Did he learn from the PhDs? Did he learn from the academics? Did he learn from... No, 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 no. He's, no one's ever understood. Who's, who's been his instructor as his counselor? Verse 14, whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him? Remember in the context here, Hezekiah is consulting Babylon. <laughs> All the kings consult the nations. Why would you consult them when God can be consulted? That's the point. Whom did the Lord consult? Who has taught the right way? Who has taught him knowledge and showed him the path of understanding? And of course, the answer is no one. Now, how is this functioning here? Well, it's reminding them God not only has fine-tuned the universe, the totality of creation, he's the creator of it all, but he's done so with the intricacy of wisdom and knowledge. He doesn't depend on anybody for that knowledge, right? If that's the case, can you trust him? Absolutely. Does he know where things are going? Is he sort of uh, caught in the world and sort of thinking, I don't know what to do about it? No, he's the one who's total, the one who's created it all. He's the one who's designed it all. He is the one who orchestrates all of human history to its end. That's how this is now grounding the salvation of the Lord and the fact that his word will not fail. His promises will never, ever, ever be thwarted. They may look like, <laughs> boy, what's happening? Right? Job thought that. Job, trust me. Right? And that runs all the way through, the God of creation and providence. Then you have in verse 15 through 17, sort of another aspect of, of God. And of course, this is picking up that God is, is independent. He is self-sufficient. We, we speak of this in terms of, uh, divine aseity. He, he, he has life from himself. He doesn't need anything from you. Le earlier in the Psalms, right, uh, God says, if I were hungry, I wouldn't ask you. Right? Uh, when we're hungry, we ask people for help. God doesn't ask us for help. You can't, right, be given who God is, you can't bribe him. You can't sort of say, do you need this God and make a deal with him? And of course, that's what's emphasized here in verses 15 through 17. Behold, 
<laughs> look at this, it says in the Hebrew, right? Behold, look at this. The nations are like a drop in the bucket. They are regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. Lebanon is not sufficient for altar fires. This brings up his, he's self-sufficient. You could burn all the trees of Lebanon and it would never be sufficient. And then he ties it to animals. Nor are its animals enough for burnt offerings. Of course, this is a tying to the sacrificial system. You can offer everything from creation. You can offer all the animals. You can offer all the trees. You can do anything. You'll never, you'll never ever say, God will say, well, now I'm beholden to you. <laughs> uh, oh, now, thank you for that gift. No, he says, even the trees of Lebanon, the animals aren't enough. Before him, all the nations are nothing. They're regarded as worthless. They are nothing. This God is, and this is what Paul says in Acts 17, right? He doesn't live in temples. He's not served by human hands. He's the one who decides what will be. He's the one who, if he makes promises, keeps them. He's the one who, if you think he needs you to help him in his ministry and work, you're fooling yourself. Nation of Israel, right? You have broken everything, but I will keep my word. And that is how this is functioning here. The God you couldn't give enough to. The God you couldn't bribe. The God you couldn't do any of that. He is the self-sufficient one that is the one you can trust. And then in verse 18 through 20, as this whole section is almost, you know, it's put in poetry and everything else, in terms of the symmetry of the poetry, really verse 18 to 20 is a kind of center of all of the section. And it's, you'll see the same question, the rhetorical question asked in verse 25. Out of this, right, so far he's discussed, you know, the, the, the creation and totality. God who's fine-tuned it. Uh, the one who has knowledge from himself. Uh, the one who you couldn't uh, give enough to in order to uh, get him on your side type of thing. He's the one who's self-sufficient. Then, of course, this section, 18 to 20, just simply says, who are you going to compare me to? <laughs> So already previous to this, verses 12 through 17, you have the sense of, you know, I can't compare you to anything. And then following from verses 21 and following, he'll further develop this in terms of, you can't compare him to anything, right? So in this middle, to whom will you compare God? What image will you compare him to? And this is a whole argument against idolatry. Right? Idols, you take something created, chop down a tree, prop it on a pole and say, there's God. Right? No, God is the creator of it all. You can't make an idol of him. To whom will you compare me? What image will you compare him to? As for an idol, a craftsman casts it, a goldsmith overlays it with gold and fashions silver chains for it. A man too poor to present it as an offering selects wood that it will rot. He looks for a skilled craftsman to set up an idol that you will not topple. That's not me. Right? I am not compared to anything created. So here is where we have, from Genesis 1 on, at the heart of the whole Bible is the creator-creature distinction. God alone is God. You don't put him in the category of anything created. Right? He is unto himself. And of course, as we work through the all of Scripture, he's the triune God unto himself, complete within himself, needing nothing. And if he chooses to save, that's nothing but sheer Race. You deserve nothing. And that's how it's presented. Now, he moves in verse 21 to begin to think of his no rivals. So he's been speaking about creation, and now he starts moving to sort of humanity and the nations and so on. And here we can say the sovereign creator, he, he has no rivals. He's the king of kings. He's the lord of lords. He's the one who rules the nations. So verse 21, do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understand since the earth was founded? He, God, sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, right? So he is over the earth. <laughs> All the people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy. He spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught. Reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. Assyria at this time thought it very important. Even in Isaiah's lifetime, Sennacherib was put on the run. 
God reduces the princes and rulers to nothing. No sooner are these rulers planted, they build their empire. No sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground, than God just simply goes and blows. And he blows them and they wither, and the whirlwind sweeps them away. This is the opposite of glory, isn't it? They're just like chaff, right? If you have a combine, I lived in South Dakota, they did wheat in the combine and they collect the wheat and all the husk and that stuff, the chaff, just blows all over the wind, right? And what's being said here, right, is the rulers of this world, God sits enthroned, right? God sits enthroned so that they come, they're planted, they've got their mighty empire, and all God says is it's time for you to go. And they're gone, right? Haven't we seen this through all of history? <laughs> mighty Egypt put Israel in chains, right? And God just brought them out with plagues, exodus. Pharaoh was reduced to nothing. And then you work through Assyria, eventually rises, collapses. Babylon rises, collapses. You all remember old Nebuchadnezzar? <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel 4, was reduced to nothing but a beast. And he eventually came back to his sanity. And then Babylon comes after, and then Persia, Cyrus Persia, brings Israel back, and then the Greeks, Alexander the Great, oh, Alexander the Great. Where's Alexander the Great? The Roman Empire collapsed. And you just go on and on. This nation will collapse. This is, this is how history works, over and over again. But God sovereignly sits enthroned, and he says, my plan is going down just according to its purpose, right? And that's what he said. Now, the nation of Israel, when you live in the midst of it, <laughs> the nation of Israel for years and years and years, a long time, has to say, oh my goodness, where are you? And they have to trust, right? This is the message of Habakkuk. This is the message of the prophets. This is the message of the Psalms and so on. And this is what Isaiah is now saying to his people, right? And so here you have then in verse 25, picking up, he rules every detail. Here is almost moving to providence. To whom will you compare me? Who is my equal, says the Holy One. Right? The Holy One goes right back to Isaiah 6. Isaiah saw the Holy One high and lifted up. And then it's a reminder here of Isaiah 6. Who are you going to compare me? I'm the Holy One. Nobody else is like me. Lift your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all of these? Here's almost like a, he's a director of all the heavens who brings out the starry hosts one by one. It's like he's orchestrating everything, right? Uh, he calls them by name because of his great power and mighty strength. Not one of them is missing, right? Look at the heavens, they're, they're completely orchestrated and managed. It's also going against the astrology of the day, which we have in our day, right? People look to the heavens and they try to guide their life. They say, no, you look to God who orchestrates all the heavens. Right? And then as he winds this down, and of course moves into other chapters, he asks now in a kind of conclusion rhetorical questions. Rhetorical questions that you are then to reflect upon and then say, he is trustworthy. I need to renew my confidence in him. I need to get rid of my faithlessness. I need to say I, I've, I've walked away from him. I haven't trusted him as I ought. And, and these questions now come in verses 25, 27, and 28. I mean, they've been through the chapter, but it, this brings it to its climax. To whom will you compare me? And of course, the answer you're to say is there's no one. I haven't thought rightly about you. I have to remove from my thinking my distortion of you, my making you like me or a creature. I need to glorify you. I need to think rightly of you. I need to think thoughts of you that are correct. You cannot compare me to anyone. And then he says in verse 27, Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, my cause is discarded by my God? Now, that question is forcing the people of Israel to be, say, we think we've been abandoned. We think God has for forgotten us. No, 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 that's wrong. He has not forgotten us. We forgot him. <laughs> and he is the one who still will bring about his promises for us. We can trust him. I need to say, my plight is not forgotten. I am not, you know, just uh, ignored by him. He knows my very existence and being, right? Think of Job. Job got into serious problems where he began to say, has God forgotten me? And God says, I haven't forgotten you. We face that too or sometimes, don't we? 
You say, I don't understand these circumstances. Where is the Lord in that? And he says to the nation of Israel, he says to us, why do you say, oh, Jacob, my way is hidden from the Lord. It's not hidden. It may seem like hidden, but I'm bringing about everything on my timetable. And then it says in verse 28, which moves to these famous verses of renewing our strength, right? Why, he says, or verse 28, do you not know, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, right? You're not everlasting, but he is. The creator of the ends of the earth, he won't grow tired or weary. <laughs> right? Obviously, it's a contrast with us. He doesn't grow tired or weary. His understanding, no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary, increases the power of the weak. Even youth grow tired and weary. Now, many youths don't think they do, but you do. Right? Now, the young men stumble and fall, but those who hope in the Lord. Now, this hope has context here. This is just, oh, I, I hope, you know, hope, hope, hope God, you'll do something. It's hope tied to the covenant promises of God. It's hope that God will bring a new covenant, that God has not abandoned us. He's not abandoned his people. His purposes will be realized. And of course, the whole book will tell you what that hope is, and ultimately it comes to Christ. Those who renew their hope in the Lord, those who believe God and take him at his word, will renew their strength. They will soar in wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Now, this has nothing to do. <laughs> I was in, I trained my, my boys and my, some of my children in cross-country running. And there was a high school in Kentucky that had this verse on their back. <laughs> so they had on their back, right? They, you know, they'll, uh, those, it says they will run and not grow weary, walk and not faint, as if that's going to give them their cross-country victory or something like that. Well, I'm sorry, that's not what it means. There's nothing to do with whether you have, uh, can do a triathlon or you can do uh, you know, running or something and you'll renew your strength or something like that. That's a whole distortion of that, isn't it? It's the people of God in the midst of suffering, waiting for God, waiting patiently for God to keep his promises. You renew your confidence by looking to him, believing his word, trusting what he is saying in the midst of tumultuous times, right? Now, we can see how this comes over, I think, quite quickly to the New Testament, right? Fifth gospel. <laughs> uh, it's no wonder, right, what he is saying here ultimately as you keep reading the rest of Isaiah and even prior, Isaiah 1 through uh, um, 30, uh, 37 or so. You already have the anticipation of the coming of Christ, right? This is 700 years out. That's a long time, right? Waiting, 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 waiting. But then we read, right, as the gospel is open, right, you read about John the Baptist, that voice. <laughs> He's crying in the wilderness, make way for the Lord. And Jesus now comes, and he's the Lord. Jesus now comes and rules the nations. Jesus now comes and goes to a cross, but by going to a cross, it's not defeat. It's not a martyr. It's not a victim. He is accomplishing Sovereign God's purposes of bringing a new covenant, of paying double for those sins, of bringing in a new heavens and new earth, that all God's promises are now found, yes and amen in Christ, right? Now, as we look at this, we look at this past Isaiah 40, it, our doctrine of God comes out of this, our confidence in who he is and his promises and so on, but we should be looking at this with greater confidence than even the nation of Israel looked at it. Right? We should be looking at it now in hindsight saying, Look what God promised. Look how he reminded his people in the Old Testament. Look at all the years that would have had to go by, how they would have had to trust him. But we now look back 2,000 years later and say, not only did he keep his promises back with Isaiah to the people, but he fulfilled all those promises. And now as we wait the coming of the Lord Jesus in the future, sometimes we begin to say, when's he coming? When is he going to make all things new? Has he forgotten about us? Uh, is this world, you think of in Peter, just going on in sort of its normal patterns and maybe, maybe he's not coming? No, 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 no. His word is sure, right? He has demonstrated himself to be true in the first coming. 
he will demonstrate himself to be true in the second coming. So what does that mean for us, right? It means that we renew our confidence in him. In the midst of tumultuous times, we keep pressing on as the people of God, saying we're here for a work, right? We're here for a calling to glorify him, to know him, to gather as his people, to take the gospel to the nations, on and on and on. We have a work to do no matter what is in the news, <laughs> well, no matter what is happening around us, right? We have a king of kings that we follow and we serve and we look to him alone, right? That's how we get through the news. That's how we get through our week. That's how we have Christian hope, Christian faith, Christian confidence. We don't have hope in hope. We don't have faith that's blind. Our faith is rooted in the God who is there and the God who has made himself known and the God who has revealed himself through the covenants and the God who has fulfilled his promises in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Well, do you know this God, right? It's not enough to just give lip service, right? We have to then say, I believe your word. You are the one who I must have no rivals, right? No, you're the one that are the one I must put first. I must think for the glory of Christ, not for myself, right? I must look to him alone, right? First to find salvation and then to, in our Christian lives to live our lives day by day by day. That doesn't mean that in following Christ you get health and wealth. That heresy is around still, right? No, it means that God will keep his promises, right? That God will protect you, that God will keep you, but it may mean suffering and trials and difficulties, but we're moving to eternity, right? We're moving to a new heavens and new earth that Christ will bring, and it's a surety, right? So may you renew your confidence in him even more than the people of God would have done in the Old Testament. And may we glory in the God who is creator, who is sovereign, who is the God of providence, and the God who makes and keeps his promises, right? That's a glorious message because we don't keep anything, right? We break our promises all the time, but he keeps his promises in Christ Jesus, right? So let's renew our confidence in him today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the Old Testament that encourages us, that especially as we understand it, as it is meant to be understood in light of the coming of the Lord Jesus and how you have not only created us and you rule this world, but you are doing so for a purpose centered in him for your people, the church, what we are. Oh, may even this week, as we go about our work, as we live in our families, as we rub shoulders with people, as we read the news, may we be reminded that we are your people, that you are faithful to your word, you are faithful to Christ, you are faithful to the church, and that we can live our lives uh, looking to you, trusting your promises, uh, obeying you with joy, and doing so as we await the coming of the Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus, that is our cry. And in the meantime, help us to be busy about the business of proclaiming him as he truly is, Lord and Savior. We commit our time to you, and we ask this in Jesus' name.